Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15216 in the name of Stuart Maxwell on Holocaust Memorial Day 2016. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr Maxwell, if you are ready, you have seven minutes to open the debate, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, tomorrow, 27th of January, marks the 71st anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz Birkenau. I'd like to commend the work both of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, who organise Holocaust Memorial Day, and of the Holocaust Educational Trust, who work hard to educate people, especially children, about the realities of the Holocaust, and work to make sure we never forget what happened in the heart of Europe in the 20th century. Together with the Scottish Government, the Holocaust Educational Trust takes two pupils, pupils from every secondary school in Scotland to Auschwitz every year, and we heard very movingly from Lauren and Brandon from Ochmuthi High School earlier today, who are two of the Holocaust Educational Trust's ambassadors, on their feelings and thoughts about their visit to Auschwitz. And tonight, in the Scottish Parliament, the Gathering the Voices project is holding a reception to which I would gladly invite all members here tonight. Now, Gathering the Voices is a fantastic project which is recording the oral testimony of Holocaust survivors who came to Scotland and thus making sure their voices never fall silent. That even after all the survivors are long dead, people can listen to them and hear a first-hand account of the atrocities that were committed. Because it's important for us all to remember that genocide has eight stages. And the eighth stage is denial. The perpetrators deny that any crime has ever been committed. The Nazis destroyed a great deal of the evidence of their crimes as it became clear they were losing the war. Not only were records destroyed, but also the extermination camps were dismantled or partially dismantled as the Allied forces advanced. In fact, Majanic was overrun before the Nazis could completely hide the evidence, and although the crematorium was destroyed, the gas chambers were still standing. Now, these voices of the survivors are vital to give the to give the lie to the denial of the crimes of the Holocaust, a denial that continues among some people to this day. Over a million men, women and children were murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau alone. And in total, the Nazis murdered around six million Jewish people during the Second World War. Auschwitz-Birkenau was one of the six extermination camps which the Nazis built with the express purpose of annihilating the Jews. The others were Belzec, Majanic, Sovivor, Treblinka and Chelmno. All of them were built in the East and Poland in lands occupied by the Nazis. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is don't stand by. And we remember the stories of those brave men and women who did not stand by and who saved lives, particularly lives of so many Jewish children. Now, a few years ago, I was privileged to attend an event at which Mr. Peter Zettinger spoke. He had been rescued from the Warsaw Ghetto as a small child by Irina Sendler one of the people whose story the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust are highlighting this year. Irina Sendler was a Polish social worker who smuggled approximately 2,500 children out of the Warsaw Ghetto. These children, such as Mr Zettinger, were then sheltered by various ordinary people whose names we perhaps shall never know, who risked their lives and the lives of their own families to keep the Jewish children safe. Peter Zettinger was one of the lucky ones. At the end of the war, he was alive and even better, his mother came and found him a few months after the, the war was over. His father, unfortunately, had perished, but he had one parent left. It was different for most of the children who came on the kinder transport to Britain. The majority of them never saw their parents again. It is unimaginable for us, having to make the decision to put our child on a train, send it off to an unknown and un unknowable future in a foreign country. It is an act of courage, an act of love, but an act of desperation. And we are lucky not to have had to face such a choice. Another one of the people highlighted by the Holocaust Educational Trust is Sir Nicholas Winton, who died last summer at the age of 106. Sir Nicholas Winton was responsible for rescuing 669 children from Czechoslovakia on the Czech kinder transport and finding them sponsors here in Britain. Sadly, the last group of 250 children he tried to rescue were trapped in Prague. They were due to leave on the 1st of September 1939, but Germany invaded Poland. War was declared and they could not leave. Most of them, therefore, died. But of the 669 children whom Sir Nicholas Winton saved, many went on 
to lives of, live lives of great distinction, including Heine Halberstram, a distinguished mathematician, and Renata Lexova, a paediatric gen geneticist, to name but two. Their talents would have been lost to the world without Sir Nicholas Winton's intervention. Consider, however, the fate of Jewish children who were orphans before war broke out, already desperately vulnerable and alone. And that brings me to another person who did not stand by. This was a lady called Jane Haining, who was a Scottish missionary originally from Dumfries and Galloway. She worked in an orphanage in Budapest, looking after the children, both Jews and Christian, in her care. She did not come home to the safety of Scotland, even when Germany invaded Hungary, but stayed to care for her orphans. She was urged to come back to Scotland, but in another display of love and courage, she refused to leave. It is terrible to think of the vulnerability of Jewish orphans without any relatives to shield them in Nazi-occupied Europe. Eventually, Ms. Haining was arrested by the Gestapo for spying, for working with Jews, and for listening to the BBC. She admitted to every charge except the charge of espionage. And for these crimes, the crimes of looking after Jewish orphans and for listening to the BBC on the radio, she perished in Auschwitz, along with many of her charges. One of a tiny handful of Scots who died in Nazi concentration or extermination camps. There are stained glass windows in memory of her in Queen's Park, Govanhill Parish Church, only about two miles, two miles from where I live, where she used to worship before she went to Budapest, and I certainly hope to go and view them sometime soon. For those who did not stand by, their legacy continues into the future, long after they are dead. Not only in the lives of the children they saved, but in those saved children's own achievements and offspring, and in the shining example of love and courage which they present to us today. Presenting officer, it is often said that Shakespeare has a quote for every occasion, but this time I have to disagree with what one of his characters said. In Julius Caesar, Anthony says, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. We can see today that that is not true. The good deeds of those who did not stand by continue to bear fruit today and will do so long into the future. Good deeds are never done in vain, and I think in these rather frightening times that we must remember the heroism and courage of those in the past who did not stand by but held out a hand of friendship, a hand of support and solidarity to imperiled children. And not just remember them, but commit to doing the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. There we are. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At least the lights didn't go out here again. Uh, can I thank uh, Presiding Officer and Stuart Maxwell for giving us this opportunity to mark Holocaust Memorial Day 2016. In fact, I, I too, as Stuart did, I want to thank several organisations and individuals for the work they do to make this important, to mark this important day in our calendar. Uh, starting with the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust have supplied helpful and uh, uh, thought-provoking material to schools, voluntary organisations and local authorities across the country and have supported a series of events, including, for example, uh, a joint ceremony in East Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire on Saturday night, a national remembrance in Falkirk tomorrow evening and one organised by Edinburgh Schools in Firhill, Firhill High School on Thursday evening. The Holocaust Educational Trust run the Lessons from Auschwitz programme, the fruits of which we heard at Time for Reflection earlier today, when two young ambassadors, Lauren Galloway and Brandon Lowe, spoke eloquently of their impressions and experience from their visit to the infamous death camp. And I would urge members who haven't had the opportunity to do so that the uh, HET's Book of Commitment is available to be signed in the Parliament uh, still today and will be around tomorrow. And members may have also seen the exhibition currently on display in the Parliament's garden lobby from Gathering the Voices, a remarkable project collecting the testimony of Scottish survivors of Nazi persecution. As Stuart Maxwell uh, meant, uh, mentioned us earlier, uh, he's hosting a reception uh, in the Parliament immediately following this debate, and I'm sure Gathering the Voices would welcome uh, every member's presence. Just one of the faces staring out from the photographs and the documents 
uh, at the Gathering the Voices exhibition is that of a young Bob Kutner. For those who did not have the pleasure of knowing him, Bob was a remarkable man. He was charming, he was engaging, he was funny, and he was a survivor of the Holocaust. Bob's family fled Nazi Germany for fascist Italy before finally uh, some of them reached the relative safety and security of the UK. And Bob didn't just write about the difficulties and the horrors he had lived through. He devoted long hours of his life to talking to pupils and others about his own experiences. His tales of youthful espionage, fleeing across Europe, interrogating Nazis after the war, and he held everyone enwrapped. In fact, at this time last year, I heard him and saw him do just that with a large group of young people at William Wood High School. Two months later, in March 2015, he died at the age of 91. Now, representing East Renfrewshire, I have had the privilege of knowing several Holocaust survivors, Marianne Grant, the Reverend Ernest Levy, Bob Kuttner, uh, Ingrid and Henry Wooger still. And what stands out about all of these remarkable people is not the scars of their experiences, but their warmth, their generosity and their humanity. Our world has been scarred by the attempted genocide of the Holocaust. In parts of the world today, the barbarity of killing people because of their religion or their eth ethnicity continues. People are thrown off buildings to their death for being gay. Our response cannot be anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. It should be the tolerance, the kindness and the humanity shown by survivors like Bob Kuttner. And one of the most encouraging lines delivered by Lauren and Brandon today was on this year's theme for Holocaust Memorial Day, Don't Stand By. As Lauren said, she would not stand by and let the Holocaust be forgotten. I can think of no finer tribute to Bob, the efforts he made on behalf of others and the millions who never lived to tell their own story. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Kenny Gibson to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to congratulate Stuart Maxwell for securing tonight's debating time. It's vitally important to remember the 11 million men, women and children murdered by the Nazi regime in occupied uh, Europe during World War II. One half of these people were Jewish uh, and they faced this mass extermination simply because they were Jewish. During World War II, two-thirds of Jewish people living in Europe were killed by the Nazis, although in some countries, such as the Baltic States and Europe, more than 90% were murdered in just a few short years. And it's not simply the deaths of these people we must, we must remember, but the cruelty, torture and humiliation that many of them suffered, and the way they were mercilessly hunted by their fellow man. Auschwitz-Birkenau was a primary centre for the annihilation of Jewish people during the Nazi regime, and those not too sick young or old were worked to death on municipal rations and horrific and inhumane conditions. Some were even experimented on and less than 1% survived. In other camps such as Treblinka and Bilzec, little if any work was required from prisoners. They were murdered almost immediately upon arrival and indeed only two people survived Bilzec of 434,000 who arrived and in Treblinka a few dozen survived following a prisoner's revolt and escape although more than 800,000 were exterminated. Holocaust survivors alive today vividly recall these horrendous experiences, and it's just as important on Holocaust Memorial Day to take time to remember the indescribable experiences these people have lived through and the lives that they have built subsequently. The horror that the Jewish people faced during World War II is one that we truly struggle to understand. However, it's vital we do not shy away from these difficult issues and to continue to educate communities across Scotland about the tragic events of the Holocaust. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day, as Stuart outlined, is don't stand by. And this is a message that we must face head on. Atrocities such as the Holocaust do not play, take place simply due to the actions of one person. Dark and horrific policymakers still gain power in the world. And while bystanders to genocide may not actively be involved in such violence, standing by due to indifference or simply fear obviously has an impact and allows those who are evil uh, to move forward. One does not need to actively support state policies of persecution in order to have a, an adverse effect on the lives of innocent people. 
The message of don't stand by highlights the accountability we face in modern society in terms of global responsibility for fundamental human rights and democracy. And this is a message we must continue to remind ourselves of as we fight against any form of bigotry, bigotry or racism. And we should remember, of course, that while the Holocaust was unique in terms of its industrial nature uh, uh, and in many other aspects, um, right up to day, the present day, um, we, have, um, we know of many other genocides of the last century. The Armenian genocide, the Ukrainian Holodomor, the, the appalling uh, genocide uh, in Cambodia. Um, and, of course, uh, we all know about Darfur, Darfur, Rwanda, and uh, I believe much of what's happening today in, in Syria can be termed genocide, certainly in terms of the Yazidi uh, population. As Robert Burns said, uh, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. But by learning from the Holocaust, we can educate people to ensure that such uh, actions do not happen again, or at least if we can, uh, such uh, ideas are kicked as far as possible uh, into, into the realms of, uh, where um, no one even wishes to co uh, contemplate the, the evils uh, that, that, that such appalling ideas generate. Bigotry and racism, no place in the world, presiding officer, and we must challenge such ideas. We are a country that has been greatly enriched by the lives of Holocaust survivors, as Ken McIntosh mentioned, and we must celebrate and appreciate what they have brought to our society and our people and the fact that many of them chose to settle here. We are fortunate enough to live in a country that is not at risk of genocide, but discrimination is far from over and the language of exclusion must be challenged. Holocaust Memorial Day allows us to begin work towards a safer future here and in other societies and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now Colin Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I too thank Stuart Maxwell for bringing the motion before us today and also associate myself with the comments that have been made in the various speeches already made. Last year we did commemorate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And it would be tempting to think that the enormity of that crime perpetrated by the Nazis was brought to an end and that the persecution of the Jews stopped that day when the Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated. But I think that's to misunderstand the deeply seated anti-Semitism that existed across Europe prior to the war to which the Nazi party fueled and also fed off because the Jews from a dozen countries who were deported to Eastern Europe to be exterminated very often were deported with the complicit support of local populations. In 1946, some 200,000 people who had survived the concentration camps, 160,000 were to survive into the new year, 40,000 died in the immediate period afterwards. In addition, there were some 300,000 Jews who had fled Nazi Germany into Eastern and Central Europe. Of a population of 3.25 million Poles, 80,000 had survived, 175,000 Hungarians, and 90,000 others. Many, as I say, had fled to the USSR, and the USSR were keen for them to go. And in fact, the only able-bodied adults who were able to leave the Soviet Union after the Second World War and through 1946 were Jews. And many of them did and fled, hoping to return back to the homes that they had left behind. Their experience was anything but encouraging. Indeed, in the 12 months after the war, more Jews were killed in Central Europe Sorry, in the 12 months after the war, more Jews were killed in Central Europe than the 12 years before 1939. I draw to your attention the experience of Jews returning to the village of Kielce in Poland. It had a pre-war population of some 20,000 Jews. Only 380 were left by the end of the war, and many of them gathered in a Jewish mission in the centre of town. A young boy who left home and stayed out overnight explaining himself to his parents said that he'd been kidnapped by the Jews in this building and many other children had been too. The mob stormed the building. The boy, in fact, had simply been away looking for food and hadn't wanted to explain why he had raided food from somewhere else. There was no substance to his story too at all. The mob stormed the building. The 380 Jews that had survived, 42 were killed. Young girls were thrown, hurled out of the top, window, uh, top floor windows of the building and another 80 were injured. Scores were killed on trains trying to return to the properties that they'd left behind. In many cases, when they did arrive back, they were shunned and many fled for their lives thereafter. It has to be understood that in whole parts of Europe, a whole new middle class had evolved 
as a result of the opportunity they had taken from the deportation of the Jewish community. And they had no interest in the Jewish community returning. The deeply rooted anti-Semitism which preceded the war did not end with the liberation of the concentration camps. It carried on. And that is why the lessons of the Holocaust, which we've heard about in Parliament today and which we commemorate with this anniversary, are so important that they be restated at every opportunity. I want to touch on just a sentiment Ken McIntosh concluded with, which was the attitude of many of those who survived, because it coincides with an anonymous poem that was found in Ravensbrück concentration camp after the war. Remember, Lord, not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. But do not only remember all the suffering they inflicted on us. Remember the fruit we brought thanks to this suffering. Our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, the courage, the generosity, the greatness of heart which has grown out of this. And when they come to judgment, let all the fruits we have borne be their forgiveness. It's a difficult thing but the heart of many of those who went on to survive, and this country has an honourable and proud record, is the legacy and memory we must celebrate and never, never simply say this can't happen again, but ensure that we work to ensure that it does not happen again. Thanks so much. Now Colin Mark MacDonald, after which we'll move to closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate and commend my colleague Stuart Maxwell for securing this evening's debate uh, and can I also commend uh, Brandon and Lauren who led Time for Reflection today uh, and delivered what I thought were very powerful presentations to this parliament. It's become traditional for us to hear from young people uh, of their thoughts and experiences following a visit to Auschwitz uh, to mark uh, Holocaust Memorial Day and every year I think it is fair to say that the presentations we receive at Time for Reflection uh, continue to be powerful and thought-provoking. I have stood uh, in the gas chambers at Auschwitz, I have stood on the platform at Birkenau where individuals would be sorted uh, into lines, those who were considered to be productive uh, for, for labour within the concentration camps and those who were to uh, unknowingly be sent to an immediate death. Uh, and it is difficult to compute uh, at the time that you're standing there, the enormity of that situation, the idea that human beings could do something like that to one another. And I think it is fair to say, and I think uh, the point has been made, that this did not simply appear out of the sky and arrive uh, all of a sudden. This was a, a long, uh, there was a long lead-in to both the, uh, the Holocaust itself, but also the Nazis uh, capitalising upon a wave uh, of anti-Semitic sentiment, which was often fuelled by individuals uh, of prominence uh, and also media outlets as well, who promoted and uh, endorsed uh, a certain view of the Jews, which allowed it to gain public traction and made many people desensitised to the horrors that would be committed uh, within society even before the, it got to the stage uh, of the final solution being enacted. And I think what I took from today's presentation by, by Lauren and Brandon and uh, from the uh, don't stand by um, the, the call that is being made to, uh, on Holocaust Memorial Day is that uh, we often say that those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And I fear that we are reaching that stage again because if we look around, uh, we see inflammatory rhetoric being uh, put across uh, in the pages of mainstream newspapers in relation to individuals uh, of certain religions or ethnic backgrounds. We see it being uh, the, uh, the, the rhetoric of certain high profile political candidates and politicians in relation to those of specific backgrounds. Uh, and I fear that many of the lessons uh, and many of the uh, arguments that have been made since the Holocaust are lost and falling on some deaf ears as again uh, a situation of uh, economic difficulty uh, gives rise to the blaming of it on a specific group or a specific uh, section of society. 
And we must stand firm against that. And we must ensure that that rhetoric does not win the day. And that those people who uh, put across that, those arguments and those who would be susceptible to those arguments are shown, first of all, the error of those arguments, but secondly, where those arguments lead. Because those are the arguments uh, that would have led in the past to the, the kinder transport being turned away in the way that we see many people now arguing that unaccompanied uh, refugee children should not be accepted into our borders. They would have led, uh, they led in the uh, time of the Holocaust to mass extermination of people. And that all started from uh, arguments around who was responsible for economic difficulties that were faced by society. It started with the idea that individuals of a certain religion or background should have to be identified publicly by some form of insignia. And these are all elements that we now start to see creeping back into mainstream discourse. So we must, uh, as we were told today, not stand by. We must stand firm against this kind of creeping, uh, creeping um, rhetoric uh, and this kind of uh, intolerance being allowed to come back into society. So I support very much the arguments that have been put forward today. And I believe that we have much to do still to ensure that this kind of extremism does not rear its head in mainstream politics and mainstream society again. Many thanks. Now I move the closing speech from the Minister, Dr Allen. You have seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I, like others, thank uh, Stuart Maxwell for again bringing a motion on Holocaust Memorial Day to be discussed at this member's debate. This debate is, of course, to remember those victims of genocide, to stand in solidarity with the survivors living among us in our communities, and to recognise our responsibility to raise awareness of what it means to live in an equal and just Scotland. Now, as has been mentioned by others, the theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is Don't Stand By. And this builds on the legacy of last year's reflections, which focused on the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. This year it is forward-looking with a clear call to action in the present. As we focus on the contemporary relevance of the Holocaust and subsequent genocides, we should consider our individual responsibilities not to be bystanders to hate crime and to prejudice, and indeed nor uh, to international threats of genocide. And nor should we be unaware of the suffering of people who are fleeing from such persecution. We have, very sadly, instances recently of abominable hate crimes and killings of innocent people, including the Paris killings on 13th of November and the Burkina Faso attacks on the 18th of January. These and other incidents should be constant reminders to us about where it is that intolerance and disrespect ultimately lead all of us. Now, there have been memorable contributions in this debate from members from Ken McIntosh, Kenny Gibson, uh, from Jackson Carlaw, Mark MacDonald, and it's been clearly reaffirmed throughout this debate that we must ensure that the Holocaust Nazi persecution and subsequent genocides are not forgotten, not trivialised, and crucially, not denied. Again, schools, colleges, universities, faith groups, and communities across Scotland are remembering Holocaust Memorial Day with candle lighting ceremonies, with memorial events, music, drama, and poetry. So I would like to thank the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust and Interfaith Scotland for their partnership in organising the commemorative programme of events taking place this week. I'd also like to thank the Holocaust Educational Trust for placing the Book of Commitment in the Parliament this week and for the outstanding work they do. The Scottish Government is pleased to have been able to provide funding for senior pupils from Scottish schools for some seven years now, since 2009, and as a result of well over 2,000 school, was a result of this, well over 2,000 school pupils have had the experience of visiting Auschwitz and learning from that experience. I had the honour a few years ago of taking part in one of these visits, and it is not an experience I will readily forget. It's an experience uh, that was well described by Mark MacDonald. I'm pleased that the First Minister has recently announced the Scottish Government's continued commitment to this programme through the confirmation that the funding will continue in 2016-17 to enable more young people in Scotland to take part in the Lessons from Auschwitz project. And it's not only the experience of visiting Auschwitz that is so powerful. 
The Lessons from Auschwitz programme supports young people to go on to be ambassadors for the project. And as today's motion mentions, and as other members have mentioned, two of those ambassadors, Lauren Galloway and Brandon Lowe from Ochmute High School in Fife, led a very moving and eloquent time for reflection at the start of our session in Parliament today. We should be, I should say, rightly proud of young people like Lauren and Brandon who share their experience and teach others about the vital importance of understanding and respect <coughs> uh, for different people of different religions, beliefs, attitudes and behaviours. And the importance also, crucially, uh, of never forgetting what can happen without such tolerance. As I said, across Scotland events will be held in remembrance. Tomorrow my colleague Alec Neil will be attending Scotland's National Holocaust Memorial Day in Falkirk Town Hall on behalf of the First Minister. He will be fortunate to hear from Inge Auerbacher, who was born in Germany and between the ages of seven and ten was in the Tretzen concentration camp in the former Czechoslovakia. Inge survived when the Red Army rescued the family in May 1945 and he went on to a distinguished life and a distinguished career. We are fortunate in Scotland to live in a liberal society where there is less personal risk associated with challenging prejudice and discrimination. We can't imagine the trauma of those living through the Holocaust or more recent uh, crimes such as the genocide in Srebrenica. Indeed, it almost seems impertinent for us to even to try to imagine uh, what that experience was. In Nazi Europe, or indeed uh, more recently during the wars in the Balkans and elsewhere, a challenge to authority would very likely result in deportation or death. So we cannot imagine having to make decisions of those kind. And I think it is important that we do not condemn what we did not experience. But we also should not perpetuate the idea that only a certain type of person can stand up against discrimination and excuse ourselves as not the right person to speak up. We should not absolve ourselves of our own responsibility. Sometimes, in certain circumstances, ordinary people undertake extraordinary acts of courage. I'm sure, and this has been mentioned by others, uh, you will have been uh, moved, uh, presiding officer, to have learned uh, of the death of Sir Nicholas Winton last year and to have learned of his amazing contribution in rescuing so many young people uh, through the kind of transport in Czechoslovakia. As uh, has been described and alluded to by others, this was uh, uh, an example of one man's courage in the face of a truly terrifying and pitiless regime. Earlier today, the First Minister signed the Book of Commitment here in the Parliament, and I encourage my colleagues in the Chamber to take time uh, to reflect and to add their names. We must, in conclusion, presiding officer, never any of us be complacent about intolerance and hatred. We must challenge and eradicate all forms of discrimination and prejudice wherever we can. So thank you again for the opportunity for all of us to contribute to this members' debate. Uh, the contributions that have been made here today uh, have uh, reflected uh, all of our, I hope, personal commitments to education and to commemoration of the Holocaust and of other genocides around the world. I think it is a, a fitting way for this Parliament uh, to commemorate this important day. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament.